suffered with arthritis for many years. And two years ago, about two years ago this time, I came home from running errands and couldn't get into my house. I couldn't do the step from the garage into the kitchen. So I ended up calling the paramedics and these two nice young paramedics came and got me up. And I realized at that point that I was no longer going to be able to drive by myself and, and get in and out. I needed to lose some weight to be able to get the knee surgery. So I had that last fall. The moment my knee got better, the hip started really bothering me. And that has, that has been the problem. I've been housebound pretty much um, since then. I've been out of the house five times this year and they were for doctor's appointments or to get my driver's license renewed. When this first happened to me, I needed a ramp and um, I called Messiah to find somebody who could do a ramp and the next day people were here to help me with the ramp. The one physical therapist who was helping me at home told me I would need a lift recliner and the next week she couldn't be here and another woman came and she said, you need a lift recliner and I have a client who's wanting to get rid of hers. So I got an $800 lift recliner for nothing, you know, and you know, this is God working in, in big ways and in, in small ways, DoorDash. <laughs> yeah. yeah, DoorDash has been a blessing, blessing in one way until I pay for it. And then I'm like, oh, you know, it's a little expensive, but, but it's been you know, funny things like that. I mean, you have to have a sense of humor. And so, and I'm able to keep my students now, most of them, um, my piano and guitar students. So that's that's been a blessing. And I have one good friend who's here every Monday to do my laundry, clean my house, do my grocery shopping, and countless other friends who just come in to visit me and call me on the phone, send me cards and letters and and texts. I don't know what I ever did without Facebook before because it's become very important to me now. And you know, those are all blessings that, that God provides for us. I have to give a shout out to Oliver too, because having, having a pet, another living, breathing person in, in this house really, really helps as well. And all of that is God given, I think. I've been a lifelong Christian, so God was always a presence in my life. But now I pretty much take him with me with, with whatever I do. I mean, he helps me get up in the morning and, you know, and, and I pray a lot. We talk a lot. We, um, it, it's not always just formal prayers. Sometimes I'll say, you know, are you watching this on TV? What do you think of that? You know, one of the things that, that, that I've learned throughout the year is how important my link to Messiah is. And, you know, you've got these, um, groups, those community groups that, that you've started. And boy, you know, that that is so important to have. And I have Pastor Rao coming here um, to give me communion. And when he comes, I've got to give a shout out to these kids, the first graders, I think. They always make stuff and bring it. And that that is so important. I keep this on my refrigerator just to remind me that there are, are children out there who are helping. And they, you know, as first graders, they might not really understand. And that's one of the things I wanted to mention um, for them so that they know how much this means to me. The overriding message would be that God will provide for you no matter what situation you're in and how dismal it may be. And boy, you know, I, I'm not gonna lie to you. There have been days when I've cried all day long um, just out of sheer loneliness and feeling isolated. And um, the thing we all, you know, nobody wants to die alone or get old alone, and here I am. Um, and, and yet I don't feel alone 99% um, of the time. And then I learned, uh, you know, I mean, how often I say what if or think, oh, what if this happens or that happens? So rather than making them negative what ifs, I've 
tried consciously to make them positive what ifs like you know what if you get that hip surgery and by next summer you're able to walk and you know um what if your creativity comes back and you write a bestseller what you know those i just try to keep it positive because once you go down that negative road it's hard to bring it back i think we all need to make that conscious effort to seek god you don't have to look very far because he's right next to us and that's such a comforting thought. Man, don't y'all just love Margie. Uh, one last thing, you know, she hasn't been able to attend church in person in two years and yet her faith hasn't taken a hit at all. And in fact, during COVID, because um, she, she had the chance then to participate in services online because we at Messiah were forced a year ago to mostly, actually most of our people are still worshiping with us online. Something like 75% of our attendance is online, which is great, but I'm not even done. She even found a way to serve here at Messiah. Uh, so over the past few months, Margie has been hosting our online Facebook Live forum. So if you are watching services today by Facebook Live, Send Margie a little love. She's the commentator there. Send her a little love. Tell her how much her story meant to you. Just let her know how much that you love her and that you're praying for her. Um, and by the way, Margie, thank you so much for serving here at Messiah, for being a part of our ministry, and uh, deleting any comments of anybody that says the message is too long today. Go ahead and just, just get rid of all those. All right, so let's get into it a little bit. Uh, our dominant uh, image has been this Kintsugi bowl. And as we learned in week one, week two, kintsugi is an ancient Japanese art of taking broken pottery and putting it back together, but instead of seeing it as broken, instead the seams are put together with lacquer mixed with pure 24 karat gold. And today, uh, in our bowl, we have nine different fruits, of course, symbolizing the nine fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. And I like to think of it this way. Sometimes in your life, uh, you, you might notice as you go through the list that there might be certain fruit that's missing, like maybe you're a gentle and you're a kind person, but if you're really being honest, you really struggle with patience. But when you bring somebody into your life that has that gift of patience and they've got that fruit around you, God can use them. You know, maybe they were just gifted with patience naturally through the Spirit. It's the way God uh, wove them together, but, but God can do that through them as well. And so we talk about healing together. A part of healing together is finding people in our lives who have the fruit of the Spirit, specifically fruit maybe that we struggle with, and allowing them to mentor for us and model for us and allowing the Spirit to work through them. And today we're talking about healing. I want to share one healing story from Matthew chapter 9. I love the gospel of Matthew. Uh, the gospel of Matthew is just beautiful because it just walks through Jesus's life and everything that Jesus did. And here uh, it talks about one of Jesus' travels, and he's going through all these towns and villages, and he's teaching in their synagogues, and he's announcing the good news about the kingdom. What is the good news? That is the gospel, that God is here to save that God is going to save us from our illnesses, God's going to save us from all things, but most specifically, God's going to save us from death. And it says that Jesus healed every kind of disease and illness. So there, there wasn't any illnesses or diseases that Jesus couldn't heal. You talk about, you know, having heart issues, not a problem for Jesus. Talk about cancer, not a problem from Jesus. Open wounds on people's bodies, not a problem for Jesus. And it says that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and they were helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Sometimes I think as Christians, we think the harvest is lousy. No, the harvest is great in America in 2021 for the good news of Jesus to go out into the world. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Jesus was moved by the crowds. Jesus was moved emotionally by the pain of the crowds. 
The text says that he had compassion for them. Uh, the Greek word that's translated compassion is actually a word that's more related to your guts or your innards or your bowels. We say that when a kid is mad, they hate somebody's guts. That kind of emotion that comes from deep down. It's not something that's up here. It's something that you can feel. It's like when you go through a breakup, you say it feels like you got kicked in the stomach. That's the kind of compassion that Jesus has. And he, and he feels as deeply in his body. We can learn a lot about God by paying attention to Jesus' emotions. See, it's, it's Jesus in human form that allows us to see and watch and maybe to feel a little bit about what God feels. And just take notice, God must obviously love the world. God must obviously love you. If Jesus is here and he's willing to die for your sins and for my sins. And Jesus also shows us that God is moved by our individual struggles in life. That thing that you're going through right now, Jesus is moved by it. He cares about it. He wants you to be better. When your heart is broken, God is moved. When you're suffering from an illness, God is moved. When somebody is going through being bullied or harassed or marginalized or, or alone, God cares. See, it's, I think it's easy to be confused and helpless, just like the sheep in the story, the people in that crowd. It's easy to feel that way, and Jesus feels that pain. It does not mean that we always get the miraculous healing we're praying for. In Matthew chapter 9, of course, Jesus healed the crowd that was there, but there were many other sick people in the world that Jesus didn't get a chance to heal or didn't choose to heal. We can look at the miracle stories of Jesus in the Gospels, and there's a number of them, but they still only amount to maybe tens or hundreds of people. And yet, what do we do with the people who are still suffering, who never got to meet Jesus or experience that healing? And so we have to sort of stop and come to this truth. Jesus did not come primarily to be a miracle healer. Jesus came to destroy death. Jesus came to give eternal life. And he came to die for the sins of the world. He gives eternal healing and he shows his followers, Christians, how to be healers in the world as well. He came to defeat death and usher in a better and more beautiful kingdom. He pronounces that God's kingdom is already here, even while we wait for its full consummation. It broke in early. In the Gospel of Matthew, he calls it the kingdom of heaven. It's like heaven has stepped into the world, and heaven's already acting on the world. It's here when we uh, serve our sister or brother. It's here when you muster the courage to forgive somebody who does not deserve your forgiveness. It's here when you sit with somebody who's mourning. It's here when we serve the poor, when we clothe the naked, when we preach good news to the weary. And even when you give a smile to somebody at a gas station, the kingdom of heaven is here, and it makes a difference in people's lives. And I believe it's very possible to live in the kingdom of heaven, even as we still experience the kingdoms of this world. The kingdom of heaven is here, but not everybody has felt it. Not everybody knows where to find it. And so God calls us. God calls us to be these healers. We're called to shine light on it so that people can find it, people can feel it. We heal ourselves and we heal others best when we heal together. Take a look at the fruit of the Spirit. A simple list, nine fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of these words are relational words. They all have an important relational dynamic. Now, it's true that you need to love yourself and you need to practice self-control for yourself. You need to be patient with yourself in life, and that's true. But we experience them most fully 
when we're in relationship with each other. Love is something that's meant to be shared with others. So it's joy, peace, patience, and so on. Every relationship can be enhanced by these. And every relationship can be damaged when one of these is missing. And so God's teaching us through the Spirit how to live these out. People, we're communal creatures. We're meant to be in community with each other. Because we exist because of a communal God who exists in Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit are a communal being. And we're the same. So we're most perfectly ourselves when we're in a healthy relationship with God and with each other. I love the writings of King Solomon. King Solomon was a writer of wisdom. How to live well in the world. Solomon wrote about street smarts, not book smarts. He cared about street smarts. And one of his books, his masterpieces, is called Ecclesiastes. And in the book Ecclesiastes, He's like so many of us. He's grieving about the suffering in the world. He's like, this life often feels so meaningless. You go through it, and there's pain, and there's broken relationships. What are we supposed to do in a world that's so broken and where there's so much suffering? He realized that a lot of our human striving for achievement doesn't really lead to anything because we can't take it with us when we die. And so as he's pondering all this, the only real solution that he could find is for us to basically tell the individual, don't live individually. He he says it this way in Ecclesiastes 4. He says two people are better off than one. They can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. That's what Margie's testimony is about, that even when it can seem like you're alone, if you just reach out into the Christian community, God can use us to make sure that we're not alone, that there's others to help us out, to help us up in life. This should be the goal of the church. This is what we're called to do. A church should be the safest place in the world to bring your stuff to bring your baggage, to bring your struggles, your trials, your pain, your fear, your doubt, your addiction. The church should be the safest place. It often isn't, but it should be. And it's who we're called to be at Messiah. People can come in with their stuff, and we can help them through it. We can pray them through it, and we can be a blessing in their lives. When did... Being a Christian means having no problems. What a lie. What a lie. That's not who we are. No, we're followers of Christ because we need a God of, of forgiveness. And when we put on our Sunday best, it doesn't hide any imperfections, and we know that. That's why we open worship today. We open worship by confessing our sins, by coming together in community in our own brokenness and fallenness and admitting that we need a savior. And then when our pastor, when he gave that blessing today, he's blessing you with the forgiveness of that savior. I love the apostle Paul who wrote our our reading on the fruit of the spirit. I love the apostle Paul because he refers to himself as the chief of sinners, the captain of the sinner team. He is the chief of sinners. And yet, this is the guy who is the greatest missionary in the history of the church. But Paul wants to get that out first before people. That he himself, this great missionary, is the chief of sinners. Um, Messiah, we need to be the kind of church where you can bring your friends, no matter what they're going through. And that's okay. But maybe when they see all of us and that we're going through stuff too, they'll realize that, hey, this is the kind of place that they can belong, the kind of place that wants to be there for them. Next week, we're going to be closing our registration for community groups. Don't miss this chance. This is a chance for us. um, Probably the best way to be known in a larger church is in groups. 
This is a chance to be known. Um, It's a chance to dig in deeply. Like the first thing we do in community groups is we get deeper into study. We get into scripture. We want to process what the Lord is doing. See, at church, you'll have a Bible teacher like me, and you might, you know, learn some stuff and maybe listen to some stuff. Uh, Some of you might fall asleep and ignore what we're teaching. But what happens in community groups is you have a chance to process it on your own and, and to ask God, what does this mean for my life? Or how can I best implement this into my life? God, can you guide me? What community groups allow is they allow people to process it out loud and not just to hear it and to do it together. So they're a great place for study. Number two, they're probably our best place at Messiah for prayer. Community groups are a chance because you you have a chance in, in community groups to have safer, smaller, more intimate conversations where people can get into the details with you. And you know that they're individually praying for you. And if God leads them, maybe they can be the answer to prayer for you. Really good pastoral care happens in our community groups because you have friends that know what's going on in your life and they can get involved in your life. And then lastly, this is related, community groups are a great chance to be known and to know others, a chance to make friends. Now, here at Messiah, we say that life is better connected, and it is. And that's what groups do. They connect us together in the Word, together in prayer, and together as friends so that we can heal together. In Romans chapter 1, Paul is talking to the people where he's been planting churches kind of all over, and he's talking to the Romans here, and he says, when we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by your faith. See, Paul's saying, like, I'm not exempt from this. Like, we all need to be encouraged, and I need to be encouraged too. That's why we ask our staff to be involved in community groups, because they don't just need to serve, serve, serve. Sometimes they need to be encouraged and need to be prayed for as well. This is how we heal together. It doesn't take away the pain, and it doesn't necessarily change the past, but it does share the pain with others. And it also shares the solution with others too. Now, after Paul teaches on the fruit of the Spirit, that's in Galatians 5, after he teaches on this, he's really only worried about one thing. Paul thinks there's one thing that's getting in the way. He is worried that there are people in the church who are putting human traditions above the faith. They're putting human traditions. They're not teaching that faith in Christ alone saves you. He's worried that they're mixing things in that they're putting other things in the way. We we know that our salvation is a free gift. It is by the grace of God that you've been saved. But they're mixing works righteousness, the things you do with your salvation. They're even debating things like Jewish kosher food laws and circumcision and other outward signs. They're putting those in place of the gift of salvation. And Paul, he doesn't think that all that outward stuff is nearly as important as the inner transformation that the Spirit does. And then in Galatians 6, he kind of says it this way. Do you want to know why Paul's an apostle? Do you want to know why Paul's a great missionary? Do you want to know why Paul's a great evangelist? He says it's because of this, because he bears on his body the scars that show that he belongs to Jesus. It's not about all that other stuff. It's not about all that human tradition. Paul's got scars on his body because he's taken the gospel to people. He suffered for Jesus. And in 2 Corinthians, he describes it kind of in detail what his suffering looks like. He says that five different times, the Jewish leaders, this is the religious people, these are the rabbis, these are the people that are supposed to be spiritually caring for people. These Jewish leaders gave him 39 lashes with a whip. And three times he was beaten with rods. Once he had stones hurled at him. Three times he was shipwrecked. And once he spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. Now read through that list and you tell me what Paul's back would look like. Can you imagine 39 whippings? 
five different times, three different times being hit with rods. Let's be honest, Job of the Hutt's body would look better than Paul's body. Paul's body would have looked like ground beef. But those wounds have healed. They're scarred up, but they're not bleeding anymore. And in fact, now they're a symbol that he's willing to do whatever it takes to take the love of God to anybody that would listen. Paul's scars, as horrific as it would look like to us, they are beautiful to God. Because it meant that Paul sacrificed everything for others. He risked his life. Heaven is filled with people who love Paul's scars. Because without him, the gospel never makes it to the places that eventually got to your families and mine. None of us would have ever heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ, except for Paul's scars. Think about Jesus when he was resurrected. His disciples had watched him crucified on a cross, dead and buried. And when there's rumors of sightings of Jesus, Thomas, one of his disciples and friends, Thomas says, he's not going to believe it. He's got to see it for himself. So he, he needs to see the scars. He needs to touch the scars. He needs to see Jesus' wounds. Do you think when Jesus showed up and said, Thomas, touch my side, touch my hands, do you think Thomas was disgusted by Jesus' scars? Or were they the most beautiful thing that he had ever seen? It's like the gold seams of a kintsugi bowl. Something is, that is far more valuable has now given healing to the world. It has made the world more valuable. When we heal together, when we honor each other's stories, we admit our mistakes, but we also cherish the healing that can come. This is the good news. This is the good news alive in our life. When you're strong, God wants to put people in your life for you to bless them and to heal them. When you're grieving, God can place people in your life who are stronger right now and who can be a blessing to you. Remember the fruit of the Spirit, the relational words. Now, the desires of the flesh that Paul talks about earlier in Galatians 5, these are things that are relationship killers. And I want to talk about two in particular as we close. The first one I want to talk about is envy. See, envy and jealousy, they have a way of relationally damaging us. Because when somebody else is really, really blessed, we, we have envy or we have jealousy over the blessing that they have. Envy is resenting God's goodness in other people's lives. But what it also does is when you're focusing on everything that's going good in their life, it also ignores God's goodness in your own life. So make sure you're not letting envy and jealousy steal you from having the chance to have good, healthy relationships with other people. You need people in your life who are blessed and who can be a blessing to you. When we heal together, we resist the power of envy. We resist the power of jealousy to steal the fruit of the Spirit from us. And maybe this is the real key, that when we celebrate each other, when we celebrate each other, it sends a kill shot through the heart of envy. And so in your own relationships, make sure that you're honoring each other's lives, that you're celebrating each other's lives. And, and let's get rid of this forever from the heart of the church. And instead, let the fruit bless. Because when we heal together, we are doing the work of Christ. That the gospel might go out, that it might bless all people celebrating and honoring life. We're going to wrap up our series next week. We're going to wrap up our series as we talk about how we can live in a world filled with brokenness and still be okay in the midst of it. And I hope you're really blessed through this. At this time, I want to invite Pastor Chuck to come up to pray for you, to pray for your families and the healing that you need, and also just to bless the table as we come together under the meal of Christ. God bless you. Amen. Amen.